Thanks very much, Hayley, and welcome everyone. This is a whole new concept to me, speaking to you remotely and using technology, so please do bear with me. Usually prefer to be able to see the whites of my audience's eyes, that way I can see whether or not you've riveted or whether or not you've wandered off in your mind to a more pressing problem. Now you can actually get up and actually wander off, and that's a little bit daunting from this end. Um, before we delve into making profitable management decisions, I'll give you a brief background about myself and the Southern Queensland Rural Financial Counselling Service. My background's in banking, and I owned an insurance and financial planning practice for 15 years, with the core of the client base in this business coming from farming and farming support industries. I have an advanced diploma in financial planning, and I've held the role of financial counsellor now for just on 18 months. This is our disclaimer, so just to let you know that the information that you're given today is general in nature, and it is no substitute for seeking specialist input for your own circumstances. This is not relevant specifically to any one person's specific circumstances, and you should not take it as advice. There are currently 150 rural financial counsellors across Australia. Our southern Queensland service is represented by 18 counsellors located in various locations. The little blue section at the bottom of our logo that you can see on the screen shows you the area of the southern Queensland grouping. The service provided by Rural Financial Counselling is free, impartial and confidential. The RSDS program in Queensland is funded by the Australian Federal Government and the Queensland State Government. Rural Financial Counsellors are a mobile workforce and we can meet with our clients on farm or at any of our offices. What do we do? We can help you to examine your financial position, analyse historical performance, identify options that you may have, help to prepare cash flows and business plans, help to prepare for meetings with banks and financiers, help to find and apply for government assistance or social support, and help to prepare for succession planning. What we don't do, we don't supply any emotional or, or counsel, emotional counselling, any family or marriage breakdown support, legal advice, or for that matter, any financial advice. We don't supply our clients with the answers. We help them to find the options. Clients make their own decisions about their own businesses. Which brings us quite nicely to today's topic, making profitable management decisions after the dry. I'm actually pretty impressed with Hayley's bold stance on this, after the dry. Firstly, we're not using that D word that indicates a lack of precipitation, and she is totally committed to us being in the after space. There's a very old saying, about business planning, and it's a, it's a fairly solid one, and that is that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. But to have a plan, you must have a motivation. You must be motivated to believe that the effort is worth the reward. Why would you be in business if you did not at least have that? To start, you have to have an understanding of your financial position. Know what you have. Determine what it is that you want. And sometimes what you have is exactly what you want. And if that's the case, you still need to have a plan because the plan ensures that you can maintain what you have. With no plan in place, we simply start to slip backwards. Identify the steps that are involved in getting from what you have to what you want. And identify what tools, what information, what information, what assistance you're going to need to get there. Develop a process and be prepared to stick to it. The concepts around planning and financial analysis can be as simple or as complex as you like. It does not have to be rocket science. It does have to be specific and relevant to your business. So once you've done the analysis, you know what you have, you know what you want, you know what the, where the tools are, then the, the tool to make that happen is a plan, a plan for your business, a business plan. Everyone's least favourite concept. But 99% of businesses actually have a plan. So now there's 80% of you quietly out there thinking, well, we don't have one, so we must be in the 1%. My experience is that when I ask any business, they can tell me what they intend to do over the coming year. 
they're going to hold the cysts till they're 600 kilos, they're going to cull empty cows, wean early, introduce an AI program, they're going to plant wheat, corn, cotton, they know how many acres, they know the cost of the seed and they know the potential yield. But they tell me they don't have a business plan. Well, the answer is yes, you do. Anytime you're planning an event and deciding before an event how you'll deal with it, you're formulating a business plan. What you're possibly not doing is recording it. So what would be the value in taking the time to record it? The value is that others involved in your business have an opportunity to understand and add their skills to the management. Who are they? Your wife, your husband, your partner, the children who are involved in the property, your bank, your agronomist or other consultants. The biggest advantage is anything we plan in advance gives us some control over the outcome, even if the circumstances change. I actually noticed that somebody when in their registration, the little section where you could put questions in said, my question is how to make it rain more regularly. Well, I can't answer that, neither can you, but you can plan for it. There are a lot of pubs out there at the moment where that was the best planning in the world could not have built a model around being closed for three months. But farmers have the advantage of knowing that the weather's variable and they can plan for it. We don't know when it will rain. We don't know what will come along that will affect our market. For example, China decides it doesn't like the way we brand our meat and our millet's no longer to their taste. We don't know if legislation will change the goalpost. But you start a plan based on realistic expectations. It's like building a house. You have to draw a plan. Without a plan, no tradesman can effectively do their work. You can change things. Bedroom can become the study. The floor coverings and fittings can change. But without a structure to start with that everyone involved knows about, you just find yourself putting out fires and fixing problems. In most cases, a business plan gets prepared under sufferance because a shiny ass finance manager who knows nothing about what we do thinks that by me writing this stuff down, it'll actually make it happen. It's an actual quote from an actual client, and I get what he's saying. Well, no, you're not asking them, no, you are actually asking them to become partners in your business. Not to come out, milk cows, cut calves, or drive tractors, but worse still, put their money into your venture. So for the bank, you need to have a plan. But for yourself, you should have a plan. When it comes to working with your bank, no matter how challenging your current financial situation is, developing a good working relationship and communicating regularly is important. Banks have experience reviewing financial data. They will understand the impact of drought and other stresses on your business. If you can support your discussion with them with realistic plans backed up with accurate cash flows, be open, honest and transparent with your bank and with yourself. Regulation is important. Make contact with your bank to report changes to your business and financial situation, good or bad. It is actually better to communicate bad but real news to your bank manager than avoiding the conversation and having They've gone into business with you. If they know what's happening, they're better equipped to protect your interests and theirs. Keep your records up to date. If your current income tax return is not available, your book keeping record should at least enable you to provide your income and expenses for the current financial year. And be prepared to negotiate. If you find they're not supporting your proposal, get clarification as to why and work with them and you may be able to negotiate an outcome that you can both live with. Now, why have a plan? If anyone wanted you to put money up for their nail salon or fruit shop, you would or at least should want to see some detail. You'd want to know what qualifies them for the job that they're doing. What skills and experience and knowledge do they have? Who's interested in buying what they're selling and for how much? How much is it going to cost to set up the venture and keep it going? What can go wrong and how will you cope with this? And how does this end? This is 
information that anybody going into a business would want to know. And if you were going to join someone else in, in a business, you'd want to know that they have these skills. Your bank wants to know this about you, but more importantly, you should want to know this about you. This is answering those questions that gives you the business plan. What skill sets are needed in the business and who has the skills? Livestock management, breeding practices, land management, all very specialised skills. Some are great with machinery, some not so much. Who's best to take care of business management and accounting? And where are we actually deficient in skills? Can we find a way to improve and educate, improve ourselves or educate ourselves? Or do we need to allow for a cost to outsource for these skills? Things like AI programs, processing, bookkeeping, mechanical work, all things that may need to be outsourced. What are you producing? What is its market? And what's the realist, realistic expectation for return? Because the business plan is trying to guess the, the future, it's not always good practice to use averages. Because average years don't come along that often. When is it going to rain? I don't know. But I do know that one year, you won't make anything at all. A few years, you'll make less than it costs to run the show. And then there'll be years of profit. If you're projecting over five years, include a good year, a few bad ones, and a few reasonable years. The cost to set up, you may well be established, and I am thinking that most people that are listening today are already established in their business and not setting one up. But in formulating a plan, you need to include, include any anticipated purchases or new infrastructure that's needed in the lifetime of the plan. Solar pump, pivot, fencing, shed. Plan for what can go wrong. It makes it a lot easier to manage when it happens, and it's a nice surprise when it doesn't. Look back over previous years and look at the challenges that you've already faced. Even the hurdles that others in your, your space have had to face and address. And look at how you would cope with that. And how does this end? The end goal is what all planning should be aiming for. How do we plan to exit? There are usually three options. Sell, be sold, or succeed. When you make the plan, you get to decide which one of those it will be, how it will be, and when it will be. And you retain the option of changing your mind. If you can resolve an answer to that question, where does this end, then your yearly plan, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, they all start to fall in place because they're based on that ultimate outcome. I imagine Cook would still be wandering around the Pacific if he hadn't known what he was aiming for. Once you have the plan, you can begin to cost it and make sure that it's worth proceeding with. This should not be done under sufferance to inform someone else. It should be done on your kitchen table to inform yourself and your family, the people that depend on a successful business for everything that the income from this business provides. Templates are available to help prepare a business plan, but I caution against finding a template and just filling in the blanks. This sometimes results in a document being completed rather than a robust discussion about what your plans actually are. The tool that is used to prove a plan is viable, and for that matter that your whole venture is viable, is the cash flow. Yeah, the cash flow. Gee, they groan. What's the point? It's just a guess. How do I know what the price of cattle will be in six months? So I haven't got a clue what the crop will yield until it's in the bin, and even then I don't know what the price will be. Well, there's the thing. The plan that you didn't have is based upon your best estimate of cost and return. This is the cash flow. It's a piece of maps that's being run in your head and on scraps of paper all the time. The best, most realistic cash flow projections are based upon your best estimates. And quite frankly, you can't have any plan if you've not taken into consideration the cost and anticipated returns. Everybody has taken this into consideration, but there's a reluctance to put the figures down and make them accountable. We're all familiar and comfortable with looking at our profit and loss once or twice a year. This is always a picture of what has happened, what we have earned and what we have spent. 
if this is the only business reference that is used, it's like driving down the road, watching the speedo, and not taking any notice of the fuel gauge. They're not my words. They come from a bloke called Michael Dell. You may have heard of him. He, broke, he went broke before he worked out that he needed to plan using a cash flow rather than relying on a profit and loss statement. He then went on to be the founder and CEO of Dell Computers. We use the concept of cash flow in most financial decisions that we make. We use these figures to provide a comparison with other options before we commit to the purchase or decide if we're going to enter the deal at all. The reason for keeping a business cash flow is to gain a better understanding of your business income, expenses and financial requirements. It confirms the feasibility of what you're planning to do. Putting the figures down makes it real and gives you room to adjust and change things to try to get to that elusive black figure at the bottom of the page. If you only partake in this process because the bank insists on it and you think you're wasting your time, then you're probably right because you're not using it as a tool to educate your decision. You're doing it to get a specific result and that is to keep the bank happy. So you work the figures for that outcome, which is not useful to you or your finance manager. Now to get started, what do I need? You need financial statements. When estimating or projecting a value for the future of things, such as cropping income, cattle sales, electricity costs, fodder costs, it's helpful to give it some basis of reality by having the actual costs and income figures from previous years. These figures are found in your profit and loss statement. This might feel like I'm telling people how to suck eggs because I don't know who my audience is or, or the breadth of your knowledge, so forgive me. Usually use two or three years as a guide to make up for any anomalies, such as drought or unusually high prices, if we ever get. Oh, I'm usually high prices. Oh, we are now, aren't we? Begin in the past so you can use actual figures and then project forward using your own educated estimates. Try to start at the beginning of the financial year. Then your figures will gel with your financial record. I've got a screen dump there of a cash flow, a, a template example. It would have been nice to fill it all in for everyone, but um, just I'll talk now as if people have not seen a cash flow before. I'm assuming that everyone at some stage has completed one. Um, you start, the top section is your income. Well, from wherever that income may have come. Um, it can come from livestock, obviously not much fishing stuff. With crop sales, the document is to be um, amended and changed to fit the person that's doing the cash flow. So it can say cotton, it can say sorghum, it can say wheat, and I always like to break it down into all of those, mung bean, um, chickpea, whatever, so that someone can see quite clearly what they've made from each venture. I've just put forward and didn't mean to, I'll just go back. Um, and if there's outside income, wages and salary coming in as well, they need, that needs to go in there because it is a cash flow. It's an indication of what cash is available to the business. So if it's off-farm income, it goes in there as well. If there's a sideline business of contract um, earth moving or uh, contract farm labouring, something like that, they can all go in there. It goes in there as well. So that all income goes in there. It totals up for the month and then it totals up over here for the year. So at any given time, you can work out what your income has been or what your projection of what you think your best estimate of what the income is going to be. Naturally, any time we do anything which involves our best estimate, so if you're starting this in July, it'll all be an estimate because the year has not yet happened. But any time we use our estimate, we need to keep um, referring back to the document, keeping the document up to date and adjusting it with actual. So livestock sales anticipated for September may have been $12,000. Market held up, but even went higher, and now it's $18,500. So you come in and you adjust it and get it right. And then you look at the, the forward estimates for livestock sales, and you decide whether or not you were probably a bit conservative or a bit too generous, and you can change them to give you a better management figure at the end so you can see 
when we're going to have a cash flow shortage. Are we going to be a little bit short of cash in February? Are we going to be a little, um, you know, where, what do we need to adjust? How can we adjust it? The same when it comes to expenses. Adjust the headings. If any template you use will have some sample headings here. Adjust them. I like to align them with that with your P&L from your accountant because that's what you're used to reading. And you're used to putting things into those categories for the accountant, so you might as well use those same categories in a cash flow. Um, most cash flows are broken into variable expenses. And I'll just flip to the next slide. And fixed expenses. Your fixed expenses are the ones that are going to go on even if you don't make a dollar. Even if you're not putting a crop in for the year, there are some expenses that are still, still going to be ongoing. Um, electricity, insurance, rates, all things that are going to keep on going whether or not it's like the motel that can't open its doors but it's still got to pay. There's still some ongoing expenses. That's what goes into your fixed expenses. The variable expenses, which were, they're not the ones that vary year to year, because most expenses do. They're the ones that you don't necessarily have year to year, or are higher or lower. You'll might buy more seeds some years, you'll might buy more fertilisers some years, you'll have a greater cost in freight, selling costs some years. They're the ones that vary up and down. But you still need to have a projection for what they're going to be for the coming year, and I like to educate that projection from the past rather than sitting there and guessing and maybe being well and truly out. If you go, um, okay, my fodder expense, I expect for July will be this, for October will be this, and for January will be this. Um, and taking a guess, have a look to the last two years. There's reasons why fodder will have been a lot more expensive last year and possibly the year before if you're in the central Queensland region. I know there's some of you that aren't. Um, but this year, that fodder expense might not be so high. So you educate your guests by looking to the past. Um, the other section are asset purchases and capital expenditure. I'm just using this one as an example. There are many templated um, cash flows out there, and they don't all fall into this, obviously. This, this, this. But this is when you know you've got a capital purchase that you're going to have to do. You're going to be sitting out a bore, um, doing some fencing work, whatever it is. You know that you've got some capital improvements that you're going to be spending money on. Then the next section is our debt servicing. Interest on the overdraft, any leases, high purchase, any term loan, whatever your payment structure is, whatever month that payment falls into. You may be paying your interest six monthly, you may be paying a monthly, uh, a six monthly principal reduction. Just pop it into where it's supposed to be. If you're anticipating borrowing within the term of the 12 months, then you know a fairly. Um, it doesn't take a lot to calculate what your payments on, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar purchase and under a chattel mortgage. Calculate what the repayments will be, and you can start and you can put those repayments into the thing, into the cash flow. Um, then, then come personal expenses. And it's up to yourself. You can just lump all your personal living expenses into one barrel, or you can break it down into clothing, um, food, medical is already in, in this particular one. But you can add or subtract from these um, categories as much as you like. This then gives you, with, down the bottom, a total expenditures per month, total expenditures per year, and the bottom corner, if we're all in a happy place, is a black figure. If we're not in a happy place, it's a red figure, and we have to come back and well, we might be happy to carry that over, knowing that something's going to be different the next year. This is a one-year cash flow. People can do you can do projections out two, three, five, whatever you're, you're happy to do. Um, you may look at certain months and go, geez, December and January. It's, I'm barely keeping the, you know, it's getting getting a bit tight. Maybe I need to bring forward the sale or something. Um, so that's kind of a rough idea of how a cash flow works. Um, I've completely gone off what I was talking about. Yeah, use the financial statements prepared by your accountant, accountant when estimating or projecting a value for the future. 
such things as cropping income, cattle sales, electricity, fodder. It's helpful to have some basis of reality by having the actual costs and income figures from previous years. Uh, usually using two or three years is a good guide because it cuts out the anomaly of one year being good or one year being particularly bad. When you use this as a budgeting tool, you enter your anticipated figures. You have a plan to plant mung beans, for instance, in February. You anticipate the yield and the value and enter the income in, say, May or June. You will have also entered the cost of seed and other inputs when you expect these costs to have occurred. It's not designed to be set, set and forgotten about. As the year rolls on and you do your BAS figures, you update the estimates with your actual, and you may need to adjust some of the estimates. So let's face it, you did plant mung beans and that never turns out the way you expect it to. At the end of the day, the purpose is to give you information you can use. It's not to fulfill the action of filling out a spreadsheet. As you go along and take the time to keep this record, you'll find it gives you some surety. Things will change and sometimes circumstances will pick up the goalposts and move them all together. But because you have a plan and it's costed, you're in a position to move more quickly and even ahead of those changes. I've got available cash flow and business planning templates and I can provide them to people, obviously because of our forum, we can't just hand them out, but um, and if anybody wants them, just make a note on the little, little um, uh, leave messages thing and I will get them out to you. Do be as accurate as you can be. Be honest, even if the picture's not pretty. Recording the figures accurately lets you put a play, in place changes that can give you a different outcome. Set up your headings in line with the headings used in your profit and loss. It makes it easier to understand and align the figures. Review and amend it at least quarterly. And remember when you're filling it in to hit save regularly. Don't think that changes to the cash flow and budget are signs of failure. They're just signs that you learnt something. And don't be backward about asking for assistance. What's out there to help? Firstly, communicate with those who have a vested interest in it and with relevant <coughs> professionals. You'd be surprised at what they've got to offer. Make use of templates, but don't just make these as an exercise in filling in the blanks. The plan must be real for your situation and the cash flow must be based upon your actual expenses and income. Maintain realistic outcomes and costing. If you're not comfortable with the strategies discussed in the plan and costed in the cash flow, they're never going to happen and the exercise was just a waste of time. So have a good look at your current situation. Look at where you're currently sitting. Establish what your goal is, where you want to be. Put in place a plan to get from where you are to where you want to be and make use of tools such as um, Templates that are on the internet, um, professionals that are available to you, independent advice, um, solicitors, not solicitors, but accountants and, and finance professionals. Monitor and review what you've done and be prepared to change when it's needed. Don't just throw the plan out because it didn't fall into place. We don't always get to the destination by, by following the same the road we plan to go with. And correct your projected income and expenses figures with actuals. Be prepared to change them. Having a plan in place in the first place gives you the ability to do that. Um, now when the plan doesn't come together and the cash flow always seems to end in the red, what have we got in the toolbox? One of the options is people like me, real financial counsellors, and like I said at the beginning, they're all over Australia and there's a range of things that they can assist you with. Um, they can assist you to find and source subsidised lending options. Subsidised lending options for those of us that are in Queensland, Queensland Rural Industry Development Authority, and across Australia, the Regional Investment Corporation. These are options where the Australian and Queensland government are subsidising the, the interest rate that you have available to you through these organisations. Uh, drought Relief Assistance Scheme, which is our next speaker is going to speak on to in, in much more knowledge and depth 
of, offered by Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, their, their um, grants and assistance and rebates on certain things that happen. Um, farm household assistance. Um, this is a scheme offered by Services Australia where those on the land have the same access to um, Centrelink support that those who, who live in town and lose their income have when you're on the land and you no longer have an income because of drought or other circumstances, you have access to household support. Um, social services, Salvation Army and St Vincent de Paul both manage a drought support um, fund. QCWA has a public crisis and drought assistance fund and there's hardship provisions under many, many companies but Telstra and Ergon are just two that I've used as an example. There is a website called farmhub.org.au. I'll say it a second time and encourage you to write it down because on that website is listed all of these things and, and many, many more options for assistance specifically for the people for people on the land. It's a single website. Instead of people going, I heard about this, I don't know how to get onto it, this one website has most of these options all listed on it. Well, it certainly has the ones I've mentioned today, plus many more. So, what to do? Have a plan. It gives your business structure. Keep it simple and real. Cost it accurately. Changing the plan is not failing, but keep everyone involved in it. And I think with my, yes, with my contact details, and the contact details of the Rural Financial Counselling Services of Queensland. 